President of Operations with Skagit Regional Health. And I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, first point of business is to um, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. So I pledge of allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United the States, States of America, America. And, and to the Republic, the Republic for, for which it stands, stands. One, one nation, one nation under, under, under God, God. Indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. Thank you. And then because tonight's meeting is um, sponsored by the Public Hospital District Number 1, Skagit County or Skagit Regional Health, I would like to ask um, that board to please approve the agenda. Mr. Shand? I'll move for approval. Second. Aye. In favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries, Yola. Excellent. Thank you, Gary. And then I would ask um, Mary, who is our executive assistant on the line right now, to do a roll call of all of the um, agencies and members present, please. Thank you, Yola. For the City of Arlington, Mayor Barb Tolbert. Here. Council Member Jessica Stickles. Here. Council Member Don Banny. Here. Council Member Deborah Nelson. Here. Council Member Michelle Blythe. Here. Council Member Marilyn Erdo. Here. Council Member Mike Hobson. Here. Council Member Jan Schwetti. Here. We also have Paul Ellis, City Administrator. Here. And is there anyone else from the city? Steve Pifel, city attorney. Thank you, Steve. Sarah Lopez. Public schools. Oh, and Sarah Lopez. Gotcha. Hi. Arlington Public Schools. Mike Ray. Mike Ray is here. Miss Sherry Kelly. Is absent tonight. Judy Fay. Here. Myself, Mary Levesque. Mark Robson. Here. Dr. Chris Sweeting. Here. Faith Graff. And Maddie's absent tonight. We also have Gary Sable. Hello. And Brian Lewis. Here. Thank you. For Skagit Regional Health, Julie Blazik, Peter Browning. Here. Here. Gray Burton. Bruce Lisser. Here. Jeffrey Miller. Here. Dale Reagan. Here. Gary Shand. Here. Yola Barnett. Here. Terry Ranton. Here. Brian Ivey. Here. And for Stilly Valley Health Connections, we have Artis. Here. Erica Coghill. Here. Tim Cavanaugh. Here. John Mino. Tina Davis. Amanda Cochran. Jennifer Mullen. <clears throat> I'm here. Oh, I'm here. Yeah, thank you. Right. Is there anyone that Mary did not call? Yo, this is Danny Vera. I'm on. Hi, Danny. Thank you. Danny. And anyone else? Okay, well, we will get this meeting started. Um, to start off this evening, we have a, um, a little presentation from the respective uh, public information officers from each of our organizations. At our last meeting, we had um, put a charge to them to get together um, with regard to COVID communications for our communities. And we have, it, it became quite a nice little success story. So we wanted to start off with that and I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie Ranton 
And she and Gary Sable and Erica Coghill and Sarah Lopez um, are going to share um, their experience over the last few months. Very good and good evening. Can um, you bring up the slides? This will be a, just a brief, um, brief presentation, but as Yola said at your last meeting, you had some small group breakouts. And one of the ideas that was came forward in a couple of the different uh, small groups was um, the idea of the PIOs getting together and sharing information in light of what was going on with COVID and our mutual interest in serving our com communities, et cetera. So we truly did uh, start working together as the title there says uh, on a new level. And it's been a real pleasure to get to know the folks on the next slide. So the PIOs have been gathering with um, Mayor Tolbert and Superintendent Sweeting. We can go to the next slide um, with Artis and with Yola um, as representatives of our unique organizations with, like I said, a very um, similar interest in what was going on. And um, we as the healthcare organization representative um, found it very valuable to be able to work with the other um, with the other organizations, share resources and information that we were receiving. We started meeting in December and we've met uh, probably four times now. We have another one on the books for April. And in between times, we also kept up via email and again, offered to share resources and um, ideas. And so uh, let's see, can we advance the slide? Mary, are you able to advance that slide? Um, you might need to change the presentation mode. And you know, it's it's pretty simple. So actually, I think we can keep talking as we figure this out. But anyway, as I said, the members uh, were introduced already to you, and Gary's going to tell you a little bit about um, how we're off to a good start with this. And I think it's the start of something great. So, Gary. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, I, and I agree with Carrie. It was great uh, forming these uh, partnerships among the, the communication folks. I, I've worked with Sarah before and Erica is the chair of our advisory council for education for the school district. And it was the first time I'd worked with Carrie and, and Carrie's a rock star. So it was, it was really great just you know, collaborating on all these different things. And, and I, I think it's kind of the first time that we've actually collaborated among the PIOs from the, the various organizations like this. So uh, it's, it's something that I, I think is, is valuable and you know, should something like this you know, happen even after COVID, I, I think it's very valuable. Um, it, originally the focus was to encourage people to uh, get vaccinated was really kind of that push, but as the vaccines became available, it really shifted to really getting the locations and appointment um, information out. Um, and, and like, Carrie mentioned, we had a lot of shared resources that primarily came uh, from her and we helped push it out either on websites or via communications or social media. Uh, information like um, COVID-19 vaccines, vaccine appointments, locations. Um, she also shared uh, some different videos, kind of how the COVID-19 vaccine works. Because, you know, early on there's some questions, you know, but what is this, you know, what are, are these different types of vaccines? How do they work? And are, are they safe and how effective is the vaccine? So there are some nice videos that um, that, that Carrie shared with us. Um, in addition, she also mentioned there was like a, every Thursday there's a weekly COVID-19 vaccine update email that comes out and um, we'll help push that too. But yeah, I mean, at least in terms of the school district, a lot of the information for us was uh, mostly posted to the district site. We, our district nurse also shared uh, some of the information with our, our staff and families. So. Uh, yeah, I felt you know, that the past several months were, were very effective and, and it worked really well. Thanks, Gary. And uh, Erica from Stilly Valley is going to talk a little bit more about some of our accomplishments and things we've learned. Hey, yeah, um, I get to speak on the accomplishments and learnings. And what we found as a group, um, 
there's a, a great value in understanding what was going on in the community. So often it's really easy to just kind of focus on um, our own individual responsibilities um, in the different organizations um, that we um, use to serve people. And so it was really handy and helpful for us just to gather um, and share what each of us had been working on. Um, and that really helped build um, at least my confidence, I think, for, for the rest of us as well, um, to make sure that we were sharing factual, um, consistent information that was up to date and methods of sharing that were on our websites, uh, social media, um, phone calls, um, people stopping at, at our doors or our, our different organizations, just to make sure that we were getting um, the latest and greatest information out to our citizens, um, residents, and um, clientele. Um, and we built awareness of the role of each organization and the unique ways each had uh, to adapt to serve the students, families, patients, and residents. Um, so we were able to take that information and kind of tailor it to um, the people that we serve. So um, it was it was a, a great opportunity. And, and like Gary said, I'm hoping that we can continue this um, in the post-COVID world. Thanks, Erica. And yeah, one of the points here, I'm glad you made it, was around factual, consistent information. As we all know, there's so much information swirling around out there, some of it not as reliable as others. So we really wanted to get together, which was the beauty of this whole thing, to really share current, factual, consistent information that the community could count on and that we could all trust as organizations. Uh, so uh, Sarah, I think you're going to bring us home with our next steps. Sure. Good evening, everyone. So um, moving forward, we are continuing to meet monthly during COVID. Um, as we work through the different um, communications, we realized that we were missing the Sonoma County Health District representation and the DEM representation. So we are gonna um, invite them to be with us in the monthly meetings. And um, as we move forward with more vaccine and how eligibility will expand, We'll start messaging that and encourage people who are eligible to get vaccinated and that will at some point include children and all the messaging that will go around that so um so we're just going to continue to meet and share information and i can imagine as we go forward and we can talk about this as a group but i think the snohomish health district would be a great addition and perhaps as we are confronted with another mutual concern or issue for discussion it could be other uh, groups within the community that we invite in from time to time to kind of get the lowdown and and the straight scoop and uh, so we can all be aware of that so it's truly been a pleasure um, happy to have developed these relationships and i'm confident that this will move over move forward in a really positive way and the idea came from this joint board meeting so thank you Thank you, Carrie, Gary, Erica, and Sarah for that presentation. Much appreciated. And it's actually been a pleasure of mine to um, you know, meet with all of you on a monthly basis. And I look forward to continuing to do that. Are there any questions from our panel um, of board members for our PIO group? OK. Um, then we will move on. Um, the next thing that we have planned is each organization will give just a, a very brief, you know, maybe five to seven minute update on um, what they're going through in terms of recovery planning. And I believe we're going to start with um, the city of Arlington, if that's correct. Mary, if you can share um, your screen. We're actually starting with Arlington Public Schools. Ah, Arlington Public Schools. Thank you. Mary, are you sharing the slides or do I need to? Mary's gonna share all of the slides. She has everything kind of laced together okay. for us. All right, thank you, Mary, so much. So um, good evening, Chris Sweeting, Superintendent Arlington Public Schools. You can see this first slide, um, it says Arlington Public Schools moving forward. So um, instead of using the term so much of recovering, we want to talk about moving forward. We want to talk about advancing and providing acceleration um, of our learning and uh, well-being plans. This first slide has the, the rock that says hope because we're anchoring everything on the hope that, that 
we will move forward and we will be in a better place. And we are in better places even now. So with, with that, the next slide says that, you know, during this time, our COVID responses have been many, of course. And we started a year ago where we, the schools moved into distance learning, which was something we've never done in, in any history that I'm aware of. And in my career, it was very challenging, but we did that. But during that time, some of our responses included providing meals for all children, regardless of their um, backgrounds or their economics. Um, we provided meals for all, and that involved really having our staff step up to um, serve in that way. We also did materials and packet distribution because in the beginning we weren't uh, as we weren't as ready for that kind of move to distance learning. We pulled together an uh, what we called the Reopening Arlington Schools Committee, the RAS Committee, where it was made up of 56 individuals, which were uh, students, parents, community members staff and um, all kinds of individuals from the district. We wanted to have as much representation as we could to talk about, okay, how can we reopen schools? What would make sense in the midst of a pandemic? And so um, there was a plan that was developed by that committee. It was approved by the board in August. And then in September it was the start of a new school year. And we did open we did reopen um, with a few students on campus, and these were students with special identified special needs or high needs or connectivity needs. But the majority of our students did begin the year in distance learning. Then in October, we moved our kindergarten and first graders back to campus in a hybrid mode, which means that they were divided, each classroom was divided into two groups, an A group and a B group. And for example, the A group would come to school full days um, on Mondays and Tuesdays, the B group would come on Wednesdays and Thursdays. And so that the rooms were, there were less uh, individuals in the room, less students, so we could do the physical distancing of the six feet. So we did that. Um, did well, uh, the transmission stayed contained, didn't mean there were not any positives, but the positives took place elsewhere. And then when uh, we were found that there was found to be a positive, we quarantined, quarantined students and staff as needed. In January, we brought our uh, preschool and second and third graders to campus in the hybrid mode. February brought fourth and fifth. And this March, this month, we brought the sixth through 12th graders back to campus. So those have been our responses. And this long list is really a list of a lot of energy and a lot of flexibility and a lot of our amazing staff and families. This has been a joint venture. And then all of you in helping this you know, to move forward. So, and, and I just show this, this graphic because we started when we started the pandemic or when we went into uh, distance learning in March, we were on step one. That means that all students, you know, were in distance learning at home. We started the school year in step three. We are now in step five. So we are moving along and we're moving forward. And step six is when all students are back in, in uh, in-person instruction five days a week, full time. So we're moving in the right direction. So as we move forward, um, right now, the moving forward responses for recovery include, we are um, having many conversations and it's gonna be formalized soon where it's gonna be put into a plan about, and we're calling it advancing academics and well-being plan. So it's our awe plan. It's our plan where we're moving forward and we're going to make good things happen for our students and continue. And it's focused not just on academics, but it's focused on the well-being. So social emotional, because that's been very hard on everyone, our students on families and our staff. We're working on graduation activities. And part of that is not just just you know, figuring out how we can have a graduation ceremony and it will be different this year. I believe that moving into phase three is helping us that we can um, 
instead of just having some drive-by graduations, we might be able to do some with limited attendance, but we're working on that. It also means that we are, the board, our school board will consider a, a resolution tomorrow night for waiver of certain graduation requirements. And so there, there's that capability after the board takes action. We've already submitted a grant for that and that's been approved. And then formal action by the board is required for that door to open. And we are planning for summer school programs and advancing programs, those programs that can help accelerate advanced learning, uh, help with the unfinished learning and move forward. And of course, we're planning for the fall. So all of this listed here is part of our, what you would call recovering responses or moving forward responses. And then on the last slide, or I guess I had one more slide before the last one. This is just what's required for what the state calls the student recovery plan or what I'm calling advancing academics and well-being plan. They, uh, it's from House Bill 1368. It is required by June 1st. And in the, in the plans themselves, uh, they need to um, include uh, assessment, di diagnostic assessment tools and, st and student learning and where are the gaps and focusing on what kind of additional supports the students might need, what kind of additional training, um, extracurricular opportunities based on those on the needs that have been identified, and then what other elements can we include in that plan. So we're working on this. The template from our from OSPI, the Office of, Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction will be available shortly in about a week or so. And we will um, be busy with that. And this plan will be uh, the board, our board will consider and, uh, and make approval of it before it is submitted. And the last slide is my thank you to our community partners because we could not do this without all of our partners. Uh, the Arlington Community Food Bank helped us throughout and continues to help us with the meals. They, we, you know, we would provide the meals in the week and then they would bring food so the children and the families would have it over the weekends. And um, Stilly Valley Health Connections, Skagit Regional Health, everyone in this in, on this Zoom, uh, Snohomish Health District, the City of Arlington, and the Stillaguamish Tribe has helped us with our vaccination efforts. And then our Snohomish County Department of Emergency Management, all of our partners, including our staff and our families and our students. It is an amazing thing that we've been doing and we could only advance and move forward with our partners together. So that's my presentation of where we are. Great. Thank you. Are there any questions for Chris? Okay, well then we will move on. I, I have one quick question. I was curious with all of your work, um, actually there are two questions. How are the students doing with their education? And then secondly, um, are, how are your um, infection rates? So the first one, Bruce, the first question on how our students are doing, they, the grades have been challenged. I mean, we have um, I, too many students. For example, when our high school principal shared with us not too many weeks ago, there were 66% of our ninth graders who have failed one or more you know, classes. But then there were less, as you went up, so there were less 10th graders, less, less 11th, and then the 12th graders we had about, I think it was 13% or so. So it, it, there was less, but we're already working on that. Already right now, the students that did not you know, gain the credit the first semester, Let's say it was English one, if they are able to um, show proficiency in English two, they can backfill that credit. So we've got some different ways that they can regain that credit or show competency in that area. So it, it has been a challenge. Remote learning was, you know, some thrived, but it would more struggled with it. And so um, it's been really important for us to get back back into in-person instruction and to do it safely. Your second question, we, we've been doing well. I mean, it's um, like I said, we've only really had a very, just to my knowledge to this date, you know, maybe one a very 
maybe one transmission that took place on campus. Um, sometimes you can't tell exactly where it took place, but what I will say is that they're, they're minimal numbers. Since we've closed, since we closed in March, there's been a 68 um, positives and that's staff and students included. And so, um, and, and we've had to qu quarantine uh, numbers of people, but that's part of the plan. That's part of the plan where you are containing that virus. What I'll say is we're doing well when those people are quarantined, we're finding that they're not becoming infectious or they're not becoming positive. So that's, that's the control factor. And we just want to uh, be very careful that we are, are uh, moving forward in um, making sure we don't go backwards. That's the goal. So I hope that helped Bruce. Chris, are your college bound students getting into the schools they want? Well, who's asked that? Peter, was that you? Yes. Um, well, I haven't really looked at that. That's a good question. I would hope that they are not being hindered, you know, by this process. And in fact, tomorrow night, we have a reopening schools kind of fo uh, focus board meeting. And that'll be a good question. We have both high school principals that will be there tomorrow. And that'll be a good question that I can ask them. Um, we, we know that across our nation, this is a challenge for all. And I know that higher, uh, higher ed, you know, uh, organizations are, they're aware of this, but uh, I'll ask that question tomorrow, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Good one. I can offer a little bit of input. So we do have, uh, I have a senior this year, um, and her application process was not hindered by the, uh, most tests, most schools moved to test optional. So we didn't have to fly to Idaho to find an SAT uh, test available. Um, okay. And she got into uh, all four schools she applied to and uh, is uh, gonna be going to uh, Linfield in the fall. Good. Wonderful. Chris, I had a quick question. Uh, well, first just commend you and your staff for all that you're doing. It's, it's gotta be incredible. Thanks, um, I was interested in the, the summer school and just the fatigue that staff and students are undergoing, how, how do you think that um, will play out? Do you think a lot of teachers just need a break or are they excited to try to get students back up to where they were? Well, I think they do want a break. I mean, I haven't, I, 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 there is a fatigue, you know, there's the compassion and COVID fatigue, but I know that we have some that are up for wanting to work this summer, but, you know, we have a literacy camp which is a different approach to learning. So I think that will be, it, it's fun. You know, it's fun for the kids. It's fun for the staff. We have um, the bookmobile and we have the math mobile. So they're kind of unique summer programs, but um, it can't, our advancing or moving forward can't just be contained for this summer. You're right, because those that, and I hope everybody can take time to take a deep breath and to rejuvenate because they are, there is fatigue, but but there will be good times and, and we'll move forward. And we're gonna try to think of some other creative ways and innovative programs that we can provide, not just summer, but throughout next year and the next summer and the next year. It's gonna take a couple of years, but we'll do it. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, good for you, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Paul, do you wanna lead us on the next one? Sure will, thank you. Uh, I'm Paul Ellis, City Administrator for the City of Arlington. Uh, the pandemic, you know, it had such an effect on everybody's business and life in different aspects. And we've certainly heard from Chris the different, um, you know, aspects the students and the schools heard from. The city, just, uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the outreach that we did, because we have certainly um, saw the effect that uh, this had on businesses, particularly our smaller uh, mom and pop shops that uh, you know were forced to close or operate on a reduced um, amount of occupancy and the effect that it had on them and then of course their their employees. Uh, so the city used its uh, you know what resources we had and, and could get uh, to help out with that. So some of the stuff that the city worked on was uh, we did a relief um, rent relief grant for businesses helped 109 businesses. Um, this was a really short application quick turnaround. Uh, just to get some money in their hands so they help them with rent. We did the same thing with uh, utilities and uh, spent about $5,600 um, helping businesses keep up with their utilities. 
Uh, we established an economic recovery committee, uh, did a whole host of things, uh, connection with the businesses to uh, learn what kind of problems they were having, anything from uh, helping them find material businesses who had never had to buy personal protective equipment, face masks or anything like that, uh, found themselves in the need to do that. And it wasn't something you could run to the local drugstore and get, if you remember at the beginning there, that was, was pretty tough to find. Um, all the way, just looking at different aspects of COVID and what it had done, um, where we could help the businesses. Uh, WSU and the Chamber of Commerce uh, partnered with us, and um, we did some work to establish uh, and help some of the businesses with what this would look like going forward, how they could improve their sales in different manners. Um, established an online shopping, uh, so you can go to shop local Arlington uh, on the website and you can shop from many of the businesses in Arlington um, uh, remotely. Uh, restaurants, we heard from them, of course, working with no dining area or very limited dining area was challenging. Um, so we uh, created a right-of-way permit that allowed them to use sidewalk and, and the parking strip to um, do business to help uh, offset some of that. Uh, the, Communications, um, you know, we heard about from our communications team how vital that was and, and the city sure participated in that. You can go to the next slide, uh, Mary. Will the next slide come up? So along with the businesses, we also worked on some community support. Uh, right away, one of the first things we did was a, was a mask mailer. So a mask, mask mailer. Uh, we mailed uh, disposable face masks to every uh, resident in Arlington. Because um, like I said, at the beginning, they were very hard to find. And so that got people some, so they at least could get out and get to the grocery store. Um, a community group came forward of volunteers wanting to make masks. Um, they ended up making 37,000 handmade masks that were distributed at the food bank um, for free to people. Uh, food bank also saw expanded service, so we um, um, gave them uh, some more money to be able to uh, um, cover the expanded service. Uh, we utilized the, the Arlington Community uh, Resource Center to help us with families that were having uh, difficulties. Um, they did outreach to about 3,300 families who were affected by uh, COVID, either um, had difficulty paying bills or, or for one reason or another, um, were having problems. We also did uh, utility bill outreach to households and, and helped 96 households with uh, utility bills uh, and supported the Boys and Girls Club uh, who were providing childcare um, and in order to keep people working uh, who needed childcare, um, we provided some money to um, increase that from 90 to 200 uh, children. Uh, we established a online uh, job portal that's actually countywide. Um, it gives people an opportunity uh, who are in need of work to match them up with employers locally um, who are looking for um, employees. Uh, so this was a great opportunity to get people who were um, unemployed, reemployed, or people who are underemployed, um, maybe on a better path. So that's just a, a overview of some of the things the city worked on over this past year. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Paul. All right, so I will present for Skagit Regional Health. And go ahead and go to the next slide, Mary. So one of the things, you know, we are going through some recovery efforts. We are working on demobilization planning now. Just like every other organization, COVID has had a dramatic effect on our operations. As, the, as our cases began to decline and vaccinations increased earlier this year, 
Uh, we continue to observe a lot of the safeguards that we put in place over the last year. And we've now begun the demobilization planning towards um, recovery efforts. And for us, demobilization is just a structured method of restoring our operations to meet our new normal state. And we started that planning back in March. We we're looking at this um, in an effort to help us eliminate waste, um, you know, keep a controlled, safe and efficient, cost-effective uh, work process. And the demobilization plan is really our personal roadmap to recovery. Um, the page that you see here is really um, just a handful of uh, literally probably over a hundred new policies, procedures, or workflows that we've had to stand up to deal with COVID related issues. Um, these are things that we need to start charting a course to take them down. Some, some items are going to stay with us forever um, as part of our pandemic uh, planning, but many of them are things that are just temporary in nature, but we have to uh, carefully handle all of the operational uh, elements around that. We have to sit down and define triggers or targets at which point certain activities can be uh, changed. And then of course, many of the things that are here are mandated on us by the Department of Health. And we look to the CDC guidelines um, just to make sure that um, we are collaborative you know, with their guidance. Um, our current experience with COVID cases in-house at both hospitals is quite low compared to last summer and particularly over the winter. We routinely have had one to three patients at CVH and 10 to 20 at SVH over um, the surge months that we would call winter, but we've had relatively zero and, and just only about three or four at Skagit Valley Hospital in the recent weeks. So that's, that's a testament to you know, things getting better in our communities. Approximately 5% of the COVID testing that we run at our points of entry are positive results, which is down from about 14% back in the peak season. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, Mary. So with our vaccinations, um, Skagit Regional Health began vaccinating their staff on December 19th. As of this point, we've vaccinated 2,174 staff contractors and medical providers um, of a total 3,600 people. It's about 61% of those who work at Skagit Regional Health or within those walls. Um, and medical staff right now is reporting about 76% in vaccination rate. In mid-February, we opened the Smoky Point Clinic and began vaccinating community members who were eligible under phase 1A. We did this as a slow rollout um, in conjunction with the um, Snohomish Health District. And they had reached out to us and asked if we would take the lead in vaccinating the uh, eligible 1A members for all of the local school districts of which of those Arlington was one. I worked with Brian Lewis and Krista Kramer, their, their head nurse at the district. And we got about 200 um, employees between four school districts through in that first week. It was a great beta group to test on because the very next week we opened the Sunrise Clinic in Mount Vernon and we've been operating um, both clinics ever since. So we do operate um, seven days a week between both clinics. We overlap on the weekends and we're able to do about 2,200 to 25 doses per week, but that's all driven by supply. The supply for the first doses remains very inconsistent, but second doses have been relatively stable. The Snohomish Health District has been a wonderful partner to our Arlington Clinic. They have um, helped shore up our supply. If we, don't get a, if we don't get doses for a week or two weeks, they will send us some and they, they have really helped to keep us in operation. So we appreciate all of that. We've learned a lot on our vaccination journey, including optimizing our scheduling process through the Epic MyChart platform. At one point, not even a month ago, we had over 55,000 names on our internet wait list. It was a little overwhelming. And as we started to call people, we were finding that many of those had already gotten their vaccination elsewhere and they just hadn't canceled their, their name off of our list. Um, so we've been able to trim that down quite a bit and we've streamlined the wait list. And our patients are now able to get in relatively quickly. They, they sign up on our, on our internet. It goes straight into our Epic system. And then when it's their turn, we send them an invitation and they're able to go online and schedule uh, immediately. We've given just, a, just under 34,000 vaccinations at this point, about 14,500 in Arlington and 19,000 in Mount Vernon. 
We've also done a lot of work around vaccine equity, doing some outreach to underserved populations, looking at high-risk populations, as well as the BIPOC communities. And we even recently organized an event uh, focused on the Spanish-speaking population in Skagit County through the local churches there. And we did that this last week, and it was a very well-received event. We had um, we had a lot of participation. We vaccinated a couple hundred, 250 people before lunchtime, and our executive team and some of our board members actually helped fill the shifts of volunteers to give our staff a break. So you can go to the next slide. In terms of growth and access, you know, as we look to recover, we have not really taken our foot off the gas. Um, we are continuing to work on improving primary care access in the North Snohomish County region. In November of last year, we assumed the operations of the family medicine practice from the University of Washington um, at the Smoky Point Clinic. Um, with that and other increased access, we've recruited seven new providers to support that location, and we've recruited new practitioners for Arlington Family Medicine, Darrington, Stanwood, and Camino uh, Clinics. We also brought in Dr. Jimmy Barger to the Arlington General Surgery um, Clinic this last fall, and we welcome Dr. Zhang this coming fall. Um, many of these providers have already begun working with several more to come through the end of the year. And go to the next slide. Along with that improved access for primary care, we have a number of specialty services that are now rotating down to the Smoky Point location. Um, these would include GI, gastroenterology. We've got ortho spine that's brand new. We have sleep medicine, interventional cardiology, endocrinology, neurology, and rheumatology. With the growth of gastroenterology, our Arlington Surgery Center is now operating three days per week, which is exciting. Um, we're also pleased to have a new full-time OBGYN starting with our system to serve Cascade Valley Hospital later this summer. Dr. Jong started with us um, with Skagit Regional Health a little while ago and has recently transferred to Cascade Valley Hospital. Um, with those recent changes that we've made with respect to our family birthing center at Cascade, um, we've got a lot of very positive things happening for future growth. That includes the recruitment of the new providers, uh, additional hospital staff, aligning our workflows and building relationships within the healthcare system between our OB emergency department and operating rooms. And we're also really excited to have a new regional director of our women and children's services leading our team. Even though we face challenges with COVID over this last year, you can really see that we've had strong recruitment activities ongoing. Um, System-wide, we've recruited, uh, I believe, 34 providers to date with 21 recruited in 2020 and 13 just since January. And the last slide. So like many businesses, our operations are dramatically affected by COVID. Our staff are resilient as we move into the next phase of the pandemic response. We're very much focused on the safety of our patients, our staff, and our community. We have all of those activities that we continue to perform um, as we adhere to changing CDC DOH guidelines and new normal is constantly evolving. All that said, we're recovering and strengthening our position for current and future needs um, to serve the greater community of Arlington as part of the Skagit Regional Health family. The steadfast dedication to safety during these challenging times and the ongoing recruitment efforts to improve access to high quality healthcare is evidence of that commitment. Our community partnerships are invaluable to us on our journey. So we wanna take this moment to thank all of you for being with us every step of the way. Thank you. All right. And then we wanna move on to Artis. Okay. Love to give you an update. Um, I am Artis Schmigge of Public Hospital District Number Three, Stilly Valley Health Connections. And most of our presentations have been done in person prior to COVID. So when COVID hit, pretty much all of our programs were shut down except for our mental health counseling program with the Arlington School District and the Darrington School District. Those counselors immediately started working with both school districts to transfer the counseling for the students to the, te to the telehealth version out in Darrington that may have meant by phone. Um, 
However, they could communicate with the students because not all students in Darrington have the same internet connect connectivity that we may have out here in Arlington. Um, we also then just constant since most of our services closed down, we concentrated on the build, uh, moving into our new building here in Smoky Point, which we are hoping to slowly start opening up for small presentations and small educational series and support groups. Hopefully in May, if we all continue to stay in the phase three status. Um, so during the time, most of our partners also weren't um, well versed in offering their services via Zoom as they were able to develop their services. We started collaborating with them and were able to start offering cooking and nutrition series classes, which Skagit Regional Health does partner and, and supports those. We really appreciate that support. So we were able to start those presentations late fall and have continued those since the fall. We have collaborated with Verdant in offering some diabetes living classes, how to live well with diabetes. There's a 12 week series we worked with them online. And also Hospice of the Northwest, we are now developing some online services with them. And the good thing with the schools coming back and having the students back in class, all of the counselors are now being able to meet with the students one on one back in this back in the classroom. And that has made a huge difference in working with the students. Um, it's just it's just been amazing, I think, to have that one on one with the students. It was a little difficult doing it via telehealth. So that we are very happy to see, which we are looking at expanding some of our other um, mental health services as much as we can. We are going to, well, we already are offering a QPR, which is called for suicide prevention course. The first one's been already filled. And it's a one hour course on how to support those that may have some mental health crises. And we will have more later on this spring. We are on April 14th, uh, collaborating with the King County NAMI, National Alliance of Mental Health, to do a Zoom presentation called Ending the Silence. And this is for youth mental health education for families. I would highly encourage all of you, if you know of anyone that could have some learning around this, it's going, the discussion is going to include the signs and symptoms of mental health, how to recognize early warning signs, the importance of acknowledging those warning signs. Any of our presentations can be registered at our website, which is stillyvalleyhealth.org. So I would hopefully, if, like I said, if you could spread the word on that one, I think that will give a lot of help to a lot of people that are experiencing some mental health issues there. And if all goes well, we will be able to open up our building to, to those of you here in our community and hopefully have some type of open house, maybe late summer, early fall. Questions? Great. Thank you, Artis. Um, thank you to everybody who's um, shared their presentation this evening. Um, just as a time check, we we have gone a little over in terms of our time and it, what it took us to do those presentations. And so I have a, a proposal. One of the things that we wanted to do was get together in the small breakout session again, like we did the last time, um, to see if there's anything, you know, what else does this group want to do in the future? Um, and so I don't think we have enough time to gather in the breakout session and then report back um, what great nuggets we come up with. But I do think we have time to do a breakout session that we can answer some of those questions. We have facilitators for each breakout session and they can take some really good notes. We can certainly um, rejoin back into this main session at 7.30 and we can decide at that point, do we want to continue for another 10 minutes to talk about um, some of those key issues or do we want to go ahead and adjourn our meeting and then 
we can send out those key issues as a follow-up um, because I wanna be respectful of everyone's time this evening. So I think that we'll go ahead and we're gonna do the breakout because we think that that's really important for us to know. What would you like to see us doing as we move forward um, in terms of our partnership together? And we'll take about eight minutes or so to do that. And then we'll come back to this room and um, make a decision from that point. All right, it looks like this is our breakout room. So welcome everyone. Uh, again, I'm Paul uh, Ellis, I'm with the city of Arlington and uh, I'm, I'm the facilitator tonight for this group. Uh, I take really crummy notes because it's usually I'm appointing somebody else to take notes and it's not me, but I will do my best. Um, but yeah, as Yola said, uh, the topic tonight is just to look at um, things you can think of that would be uh, you know, good items for us to to work on as a group moving forward. Um, when we met uh, last year, uh, communication was one of the things that kind of floated to the top out of some of these groups. And so we've had our PIOs working on that ever since. And we've been able to, as you heard tonight, do some joint um, communications together uh, as part of the uh, pandemic information. So I'll open the floor up if there's any thoughts, uh, comments that uh, people have. Is the uh, city of Arlington, is the logo going to talk? I see that we have a it, the video there. Or somebody's just says city of Arlington. Oh. that That's just you running it. There's four of us. Well, I guess what I would uh, look for is, is uh, more of the continuation. I really liked how, especially with the uh, vaccinations, because that's so important that uh, everybody's communicating that and I was fairly, I, I've been um, aware of it and, and watching it, I was impressed with how many uh, they've done at both places. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's been a real uh, stress on uh, the healthcare system at Skagit. I mean, in, in Arlington, it's fairly expensive to put on. So I think, uh, you know, getting out the information and getting people vaccinated in, in Snohomish County is certainly uh well served by them and so uh, you know I, I think communication one thing that we talked about before I thought was maybe getting more communication to the people that come to these meetings of you know like I, we hear about things once every six months or four months and it'd be nice to have like just an email among ourselves of you know once a month or something just highlight what's what's going on um, because okay. That's one thing I, I think would help rather than uh, just coming in, trying to catch up in a, in one fell swoop in an evening and then don't hear from anybody for six more months or limited, like, especially for me with grandkids, you know, what's the school doing? I mean, I read the newsletter and stuff and, you know, and, and I get the city email and I try and keep up on that. But sometimes uh, what they talk about here is a little more of a broad view. Uh, and I, I like it. So, you know, if there's somehow to communicate with that, just an email that people that are in this could, could, uh, you know, like sign up for mm -hmm. when, you, when you guys get together. So that'd be my input. Okay. Paul, I really like the stuff you're doing in your city. Um, it's pretty exciting. That's one of the best lists I've seen in a long time for. So your city is really engaged and, it, it's at some point we're going to have to get people back out and feeling good about being healthy. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how to, what that would look like or how to do it, but it, it's, it's a wear our masks, but still start to get out among each other and, and remember wow. the community. We, we were honestly really hoping that, uh, and still are that we get a little more uh, guidance from the state level as to, you know, like outdoor activities and stuff for the summer, because we're trying to plan in, in the event that that happens and we can open some of those 
activities up how we would do it um, because we do want to get people back out and get um, get used to uh, being together and doing events. Uh, we just got to remember to do them safely. It's wear your mask, social distance, and and take the precautions. But uh, you know, I think it, unfortunately, I think, I think the, the state just doesn't think about all the things we do for exercise. I mean, I I've known the governor for a long time, and I sent him an email about twice a week saying, when are you going to open the damn golf courses? Because we don't get sick out there. And uh, they finally did. And so I think we got to kind of do that. The guy that's our, our representative, um, Joe Timmons, is really responsive. And so things that you yeah. see in your community that you want done, you and I can call them up and say, Joe, this is what this is our question. And this is why we think it's a good idea. And they are pretty, they're pretty willing to listen. And yeah. so I think it's some, some real clear, ideas of what you'd like to do and then just put them on the spot and say, explain to me why this is not a healthy solution or healthy alternative uh, opportunity. So yeah, I think that's a very good point. Yeah. I get to, I've been driving a little crazy. He's getting used to it now. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was a middle child and I was born to be an irritant. So I, I could I'd do it well. <laughs> You're muted, uh, Tina. There we go. Well, I try to, you know, stay muted, so <clears throat> can't hear the background. What can I say? <laughs> um, well, I took a lot of notes um, because I think it's amazing everything that we've been through in this last year, how everybody has come together at some point and really trying to focus on what the need is in our community. And, you know, just knowing, and, and I think I read in the city, um, newsletter or whatnot about how much money they and how many businesses that help they, they helped and with the utilities and things like that so I think those are really really important things for us all to um to know and then um with Yola talking about how many people were vaccinated and whatnot and so I'm just going to kind of piggyback onto what Tim said it really would be good if we did have something so we were all giving, being able to hand out the same message because so many times they come to all of us to say, hey, what's going on at the school? Or, hey, why is the city doing this? Or, um, you know, what are we going to do? You know, I have two teenage grandchildren. You know, I know what the mental health stuff is doing to the kids, um, you know, to the parents even mm -hmm. because, you know, the parents don't know how to handle it either. And. So being a grandparent, that's the good part because you can calmly say, well, do you remember what you did when you were a kid? <laughs> and <laughs> well, I know, but I'm like, but this is different. This is the middle of a pandemic and we really need to think about the kids don't have enough socialization right now and they need to be able to, um, that's part of them growing up. Yeah. And so it's really trying to help everybody in different stages. And I, I really enjoy our group coming together like this because I find out so much. So thank you. We've got about one minute according to the timekeeper. If there's any other thoughts. I would love to see uh, our community uh, celebrations go on this summer and the outdoor ones. And I'm, I'm going to push for that because I think it's, it's time to get out and see each other and remember why we live in the communities we live in. So yeah. uh, I think uh, and those I are sure. I think that's things. healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, really at this stage, we know that's fairly safe outside, Yeah, mm -hmm. but, you know, going back to my one, uh, and what Tina said, you know, about communication, Paul, especially during this time when things are so fluid, it, it'd be most important for us to all, like Tina said, uh, stay in touch so we all have the same message. Yeah. 
think we use that exact same terminology. I'll have the same message. Yeah. All right, welcome back everyone. Thank you for um, all of the commentary that you've made. So we have a decision point to make at 7.30. Um, generally our meeting should be done by now. Um, I would imagine that sharing responses from all of the groups would probably take about 15 minutes. Um, we can either ex you know, extend the time of our meeting this evening and, and share some of those or the facilitators can submit those to Mary and we can type everything up and send it out to um, everyone post this meeting. So I guess, you know, a show of hands, you know, who would like to extend? Um, I see, I see a couple, extend, extend. All right, I'm seeing some smiling faces. All right, we'll go ahead and we'll extend. Um, thank you, everyone. And um, I'm gonna start with, with my group, because I'm currently speaking and the notes are right in front of me. Um, one of the things that came out of our group was that they'd like to see us have a liaison with each emergency uh, management uh, coordinator or our EOCs and just have constant uh, communication. And we would like to see a little bit more in terms of the after action review that was done by the organizations in terms of what are some of the opportunities that we have to improve our responsiveness in the future um, should the next pandemic strike. Um, we also talked about messaging. Um, pretty much the, the majority of our time was spent on communication. And I think for most of us, communication is a very important part of our organization. And having that consistent messaging and the work that we've done recently to have the same messaging and to leverage one another's um, resources that we all have to come up with that messaging um, is important. So our work for the future is to continue some of those efforts. It sounds like um, our respective public information officers have already chosen that's what they're going to do as we get ready to vaccinate children. And then I think that was really, that was really it. It was all around taking from our after action report, learning what, what we could do better the, the next time around or with, you know, maybe with an earthquake or a, a decon situation or anything into the future. So I will turn it over to the next facilitator. I think I'm gonna pick on Chris. Okay. Um, in our group, we had a great conversation and what we started with and which is, is everybody agreed is that we would like to see this group spend time uh, thinking and talking about how are we going to and how are we responding to the tremendous growth that's that's here and that's coming. Um, Jan shared that there'll be about 10,000 new jobs and there'll be more people. And so how are we, each organization responding or preparing, such as uh, what was mentioned also is um, preparing for the need for a new element elementary school and understanding the, the facts of that and maybe having a demographer do some, um, some collection of data and information on the future for 10 years and looking it out over 10 years. We also shared uh, the comment was that we're, we're like a, a wonderful community that's connected together and we love that we can do this jointly and that community feeling. And we wanna keep that as we grow and as we work through these and respond to these um, opportunities. The other thing we said is that we'd like to see this group together talk about uh, our, our efforts towards uh, equity and uh, culturally responsiveness. Uh, as organizations and as a group together as, as a unit. And um, also continue, continue the communication group because that's been wonderful. We're just kind of getting started, getting the moment, momentum going on communication. So that's our group. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Um, Carrie, I think, did you lead a group? Chris was the leader of the group I oh. was in. All right. 
um, artists. Okay, a lot of ours too was around communication, but one of the first comments was to also maybe go back and pull out our previous lists from when we met back in November 30th, of possibly 2019, just to double check that to see if there's anything there. Um, looking at joint education possibilities between all of us. And again, looking through the lens of diversity and equity right now. And with the sharing of information, again, that came up the communication efforts, especially now as we're focusing on recovery and possibly as we identify the struggling um, pockets of needs, getting that out so we can help the, those areas. Um, sharing data throughout the recovery period and possibly adding messaging from the school district onto the Arlington newsletter um, so that we can get some consistent information out there as well with the school program. Um, and, and any particular partner, so if Skagit Regional Health has anything they want to put there to keep it consistent to do that as well. And as we're bringing people back into the workspace um, and with various businesses having some reluctance to open up, how do we again come back to help people feel safe as we're going through the opening up process? And just basically reestablishing that comfort level in the recovery phase for people to get together again. Um, Education on how well the vaccination process is going and watching our protocols, keeping our distance, wearing our masks, et cetera, so we can keep the cases down. That's ours. Great, thank you. Paul, did you have a group? Yeah, thank you. Uh, our group was uh, around communications also, very similar to what we've heard so far. Um, keeping communication going. A suggestion, maybe some kind of a internal communication uh, also, just to keep um, uh, this group uh, in the know, um, one of the comments was, is that, uh, you know, this group touches, uh, collectively touches so many different people from different walks of life. It'd just be good if we all had the same information. So that was a, a good comment. And then um, the need to get people uh, outside and active again, uh, as time, as, it, as it's allowed, excuse me. Um, and again, kind of more of the comfort level, you know, just whatever we can communicate to make people comfortable to get back out and active. So all along, along communications. Excellent, thank you. Um, Brian, did you have a group? Yes, I did. Uh, so what uh, our group would like to see in the future is to continue uh, the joint communications across the different agencies uh, and to begin focusing on uh, communications regarding uh, COVID vaccinations uh, as more and more people become eligible to uh, receive a vaccination uh, it's going to require a greater degree of communication to reach these folks and make sure that they know that they're eligible and that it's safe and where they can get it. Uh, also um, talked about sharing resources to promote uh, public engagement in, uh, in agency meetings uh, as we move to a face-to-face -face model for uh, in-person meetings, uh, while at the same time providing access via Zoom. Uh, one of the lessons uh, learned that we can make improvements on is that uh, throughout this, uh, this challenge, it led to uh, introspection regarding our current practices and resources that were previously taken for granted. And, and revising those uh, if necessary to, to continue to be effective. And, and the importance of technology, particularly access to the internet, uh, especially uh, for communications and connecting people together uh, and what can we do uh, to improve that access to the internet uh, across the Arlington region. Thank you. Thank you. And Gary, did you have a group? Yes, I did. Yeah, our group uh, talked about what we'd like to see in the future, just like others have, have shared, to continue with the joint communications among the various groups. Um, and it, they also were wondering, you know, we hear from the Arlington School District, but what about other school districts that, that are, are serviced, uh, you know, by the different uh, hospital districts and maybe get an update from them as well, just to get uh, kind of contrast, you know, to what Arlington is doing. 
Uh, what lessons do we learn that we can make improvements on? Um, I mentioned that we're always improving communication. It's just, you know, honing the message and, and, and sharing it broadly is important. Um, they also mentioned uh, if there's some way to sign for the various entities, uh, newsletters or information that's sent out is just some a mechanism where they could get uh, newsletters just so everyone's in the know of what's going on. And then where do we go from here? I continue to communicate updated COVID information, um, but also even you know after the pandemic, you know revisiting some of the, the things we talked about in the past, like the uh, opioid crisis, um, certainly mental health, um, not only among students but just in general among the community, and, and then trying to you know especially with, with the way that the communication uh, team has come together, you know be prepared for things you know for the future, <laughs> right? plan for these. So. Uh, that's what our group shared. Wonderful, thank you. Were there any other groups, um, facilitator, that I've missed? Okay, fantastic. Um, thank you everyone for taking that few extra minutes to go through that exercise with us. Um, we find that very valuable as we get together and plan uh, for these particular meetings. And we certainly want to make sure that what we're doing for you is value added. We, we truly respect all of the time that you put in and, and give to your community. And we appreciate that very much. So we will um, get these minutes uh, put together and um, tidied up. And then we'll have those sent out to all of you so that you can review that in preparation for the next meeting. And thank you very much for joining us this evening. And I believe our next meeting will be hosted by Arlington Public Schools. Um, it's set for November 29th. It seems like it's a lifetime away, uh, but it's really, it's gonna be just around the corner once we get through this summer. So everyone stay safe and stay healthy. And um, I look forward to seeing you in November. <laughs>